Yo, what's up guys? Mad Zach here and uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the techniques and behind the scenes uh, type of information about this last video that I did for Ableton where I was performing on the 64 pad uh, sound pack that I'd made. So yeah, basically for me, uh, I've been working for a long time in the 16 pad paradigm. Um, you know, where you have a few drum sounds, maybe a bass or a hook sound and one or two atmospheres. Um, and so for me, moving up to 64 from 16 was really a process of building upon what I had and expanding all of those sound types. I think one of the most important things that I could talk about with regards to um, this type of setup where you're working with all these pads and sounds is actually sort of the placement and distribution of where I put the different types of sounds. A lot of people when they see this happening, they're like, oh my God, yeah, but how am I ever gonna remember where all those sounds are? Um, and so I have a bit of an answer to that and it's wrapped up in sort of my technique for creating the packs. Basically, it revolves around muscle memory. So I always put, you know, the same sounds in the same places and I've developed it in such a consistent way that now I can play just with muscle memory through any of the sound packs. So you can see here on this sound pack, I can play that same beat like that, or I can also go over to the next sound pack and play the exact same pattern. So even though it's a lot of buttons to remember, once you've developed this sort of muscle memory, it's all good. The other thing is that I put a lot of similar sounds near each other. So you can be safely resting assured that in most cases, the sounds around where you're trying to hit are relatively similar to what you're trying to play. So for example, if I'm all, you know, using this as my snare and then I hit that, it's not gonna be like the end of the world. One of my favorite things about having more sounds at my disposal is the ability to create a lot more intricacy and expression within a specific type of sound. So for example, um, over here on the 16 pad rack, I have basically just these two kicks, the one that's a bit more of a decay going on and this one, which is just a bit higher. So that's pretty typical for a 16 pad rack. But uh, if we go over to the 64 pad pack uh, that I was using in the video performance, um, you'll see that actually I have uh, five different tunings of this bass drum kick um, as well as a muted softer kick. And this is really cool because um, now instead of just being like I can get a little funky and be like So yeah, up next to talk about another way that I like to um, add a bit more of dynamic versatility to a pad, um, which is that uh, the duration that I hold a button down actually affects the sound that is played, both the character and, well, everything. Um, so let's talk about the way that applies to this hat shaker sound. So here we have a shaker, but you'll notice that if I just tap and hold it down, it does this short thing with a little delay versus when I tap it, it has a nice long release. And the, the way that that setup is really simple, um, but really useful. So if you take a look at here, um, and ignoring this LFO max thing that's on the sustain, basically I have the decay set down and the release long with the sustain kind of down at a lower value. And just because of the sort of the physics of the way an envelope works, I'm not sure if you can call it physics, but the math of it, it works out so that if you just tap it, it's going to uh, release the volume at whatever level it was at in this decay process. Um, but if you hold it down, then it works its way through the whole decay process and winds up down at that lower sustain value. So here's an example of how I'm gonna integrate that into a beat and you can hear the variety. Another really cool technique for adding a bit of um, 
variety and dynamic to a pad sound is by using an LFO and uh, it's called a non-retriggering LFO basically and you route it to something like the filter or the pitch and here's an example of that in action. So you can hear that every time I hit the button it's actually playing the filter at a different place and that's because even though the filter is moving like this um, because of the LFO each time that I tap the button is actually happening at a different place in that LFO's throw. And the result is this scratch type sound, so. So I'll show you how that breaks down in Ableton real quick, which is, um, this is the sound without any filtering. Just some plain white noise with a bit of delay. Um, but I turn on the filter, and then you want to select band pass 24, pump up the resonance a bit here, and you can adjust these settings, you know, frequency as, as, as you like. Um, and then you pull up the LFO here, make sure this is turned on, and this is turned off so that it's not re-triggering every time you hit the button. Another one of my favorite ways to sort of um, combine uh, just get more mileage out of each pad is to have sounds that again are different when I hit them for a short period of time versus when I hit them for longer. But whereas with uh, this one, it's just uh, different in the actual sound. This is actually will play a percussive loop if I hold it down. But if I just tap it, I can still use it as a one shot, which can be really cool if you're like, Next, I'm going to be talking about a few different techniques that I've used to pull the sound pack together and really glue it and make it feel a bit more like a final mix than just a bunch of one shots uh, loaded into cells. So the first way that I do that is by utilizing uh, the send and return chains within Ableton's drum rack. I've got here just a reverb and a ping pong. Um, with a bit of an uh, effects rack going on. It's not just a ping pong, it's a ping pong and an auto filter that's moving a bit and that's being sidechained as well. So they're effects chains, but the idea is that they're actually existing within the drum rack and not as an external send and return. Um, so yeah, the advantage of that is that anytime I'm working on a sound and I wanna add you know, a little bit of delay or reverb, I don't have to actually load up a separate um, instance of that effect, I can just send that sample to my bus. So that's the first technique. Uh, the second technique is more having to do with uh, side chaining. So one of the big things in my mind that uh, differentiates uh, a typical sound pack or live performance with a finished track is um, this really tight mix and the gluing together which is caused by the side chaining. So let's say we have a sound like this, for example, or let's use this choir sample. So normally, uh, the way that side chaining in Ableton works is that you have to, since there's only one side chain input on the compressor, uh, typically you would have to put a separate compressor for each thing that you wanted to be the side chain source. So even though I have, you know, all these kicks, I would have to have a separate separate instance of compressor for each one of those um, source sounds. But what I do um, as a workaround, which I'm very happy with, is to create a, what I call a ghost bus, um, also within the drum rack. So the same way that I created these effects returns, I just created a blank uh, return chain with no effects in it, and I mute it. Um, and so now on the actual, Thing I want to be side chained um, in the audio from I select the drum rack that I'm in and then on the second option drop down I choose the side chain bus um, then anything I want to be the source for the side chaining uh, all I have to do is send that to this ghost side chain bus and because it's muted you won't hear any of those being layered in again 
But if I go back to this, this thing that I want to be sidechained, you can see that when I hit any of these buttons, it's triggering the compressor just the same. So yeah, a one more technique, a little trick that I do sometimes, I don't know if it's a trick, but just a, a little tip, sometimes throwing a saturator on the master of the drum rack, like just after the whole drum rack, depending on where your levels are at already, can be a nice trick to sort of further glue things together. Adds a bit of overdrive and makes things morph together in a cool way. So um, you'll hear before, here are the kicks with the saturator. Maybe put a dB on there. So that pretty much sums up everything that I wanted to go over in terms of techniques uh, and what went on behind the scenes with creating these 64 pad racks. Um, as a finishing note, I'd just like to add that these are f can be for a lot more than just jamming out. Um, I use them actually as a production tool. So because there's 64 sounds, you have actually every sound that you would need to create a song with right here in the drum rack. So all you have to do is load up the drum rack and you know either play in your parts and arrange it like that or even just draw it in with your mouse. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Again, if you want to pick up these sound packs, uh, you can grab them from Ableton. Uh, they should be free from the Ableton website included with this new uh, update. And again, I'm Mad Zach and I hope that you enjoyed this video and all of the sound packs uh, I've been having so much fun with them, so I know you're going to as well. And until next time, peace out.